So, my name is Tom Smith. Uh, I'm from a company called Wireless Connect in Ireland. We operate a small ISP in the Midlands and we also provide extensive uh, consulting services to uh, clients in, in, from service providers, financial institutions and stuff like that regarding network security and uh, bespoke solutions. I suppose why I'm here is I suppose I was inspired by others who lead the charge so they're named there um, and I suppose uh, I've often found when I started in the microtech community that the videos were quite helpful in actually setting up uh, my own ISP when I knew pretty much nothing thing about Microtech, so that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a trainer since 2007 and I'm pretty much passionate. I'm, I, I quite like Microtech Root OS a lot um, and I suppose it's like a relationship with a girlfriend. Uh, sometimes we, we argue but uh, there is a lot of love there. But um, And I do like exchanging ideas and talking about problems on networks and solutions of course for them. So if you catch me on the floor later or possibly at the bar, I'd uh, be happy to have a chat with you later. So, um, basically our company's been with Microtech since 2006 and uh, I've presented about 11 presentations so far in all the months uh, in various locations around the world. So our favourite routing product just to start off would be kind of an X86 router with running Microtech Router OS um, and I particularly like it with the hot lava cards because you get the TEG gig. So uh, we find the performance on them quite good. Obviously the cost is significantly higher than the cloud course but we feel that you know with the performance is actually quite good as well. Uh, so what are, my, what are my presentation objectives? It's kind of along with theme if you've been tracking some of my presentations around the world. Uh, it's about BGP and denial of service. So my good friend Matthew Kianter will be uh, doing a similar presentation later and I'm looking forward to uh, the exchange of ideas and uh, I learned stuff from him because he's a great guy. I was in training with him back in 2007 so i really looking forward to that presentation. I also think the topic is quite expansive and it's actually a huge uh, area uh, there's lots of different nuances and uh, be honest every time I have to deal with an attack I always have to learn something new you know and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a continuous learning process and so refinement of your technique. Um, so basically, we use Microtech. If it could root, or if if if, if we have a pro if Microtech could do it, we generally use it. So we use Microtech extensively as a routing platform. Full root tables, over 60 peers, uh, redundant root reflectors. Um, use the EBGP with uh, around 60 upstream peers so and uh, two transit providers. So um, it's very capable. Uh, uh, platform and it can scale to that and it delivers it at a significant cost reduction when you compare it with the, let's say, the bigger incumbent uh, hardware providers on, micro on networking in general. Um, so BGP in brief, uh, why am I talking about BGP? Because BGP is, um, is, I suppose it's the protocol that links the internet together, but it also allows for signaling. It allows, it allows ISPs give each other information about specific routes. So it's not just about saying this route is reachable via me, but it's showing you how the, pa how the, how the traffic actually arrived at your location, what's the nature of the traffic. Uh, if you have, let's say, peering with a trot or the likes of Cogent, they actually said community is based on the source IP of the uh of the of the traffic uh, that uh, or the source country, so you can actually uh, get information about where traffic is coming from or where prefixes are coming from, um, and it's because precisely because this signalling uh, uh, capability is why PGP is so useful in both obviously pro uh, propagating the internet tables, but also in also propagating responses to uh, denial of service attacks, and we'll be discussing that in some detail today, and I'm sure Matthew will be following up later on as well, and I'm really looking forward to his presentation. Um, just under the bonnet uh, of B uh, BGP, just to briefly, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it uses TCP transport protocol for the communication of messages because the sessions stay up for quite some time and obviously it's important that if routes are withdrawn or updated or added that the message between the two routers that are talking, actually, the message actually gets there so that there's not uh, black holing of routes or slow uh, slowdowns in uh, convergence or inconsistent convergence the tables. 
So, denial of service tax, I'm sure you've all probably had one or two of them in your time and it's not a pleasant experience and generally there's different modes. The one we're going to actually to talk about today is pretty much network uh, denial of service tax, so kind of saturation of resources on your upstream provider links, um, saturation of CPU resources on your core routers, as opposed to, let's say, a targeting a particular vulnerability on a website, for example, okay? So it's just, but the attacker's objective is pretty much to either embarrass you or shut you down. Uh, embarrassing you is probably the least of your concerns when it's happening um, and obviously shutting you down. And there have been cases where sustained denial of service attacks not being properly managed have resulted in the closure of ISPs or hosting providers. So it is a significant threat um, and unfortunately it's getting more and more common. So the types of denial of service tax, you have your simple kind of uh, single source denial of service tax. So you've got, you've got the attack, you know where it's come, roughly where it's coming from, or at least it has a consistent source. And they're probably the more easier. They can still be potent, but they're actually easier to kind of thwart because now you know, okay, it's, it's consistently this source address. Then we move into the uh, distributed denial of service. So these ones are tend to be obviously even more potent. They're also quite difficult, they're more difficult to kind of track down where it's coming from. Uh, and particularly, you know, you have to react quickly. And generally the reaction, as we'll, we'll, we'll discuss later on, is the reaction is to actually take out the victim IP so that you're actually reduce the traffic. So effectively you complete the attacker's objective uh, momentarily um, to save your other uh, uh, your other customers. So th then we go for reflected application attack, and we go through these in more details. But this is where you spoof traffic against what we would call facilitators or misconfigured routers on the internet, and effectively uh, you would actually use their bandwidth to attack the other person. And uh, those ones are, tend to be the biggest uh, biggest hitters because you could actually amplify whatever your the attacker is using is effectively using each one of these people who have misconfigured their routers or their servers as a force multiplier. We'll discuss that in more detail. So what's so difficult about DDoS? Well, the, the most difficult thing is there's absolutely nothing specific on your router that you can change. Um, I will contradict this later, but there's nothing specific on your router that you could change to actually stop the DDoS. There's nothing, what you actually have to do is you have to look outside of your own ISP, you have to think outside the box and actually ask the guys above you who have better bandwidth and better capabilities to actually help you solve the problem. And that, that is the key, I suppose. So if you take anything, so you can all leave if you want now, but if you take that as being the way you have to respond to a DDoS, that's effectively it, that you have to get help from your peers and your transit providers. Sorry. So out of the box thinking, so if we're talking about that, the problem is that when, it, when the traffic arrives at your router, it's too late. You've saturated your link, you've wa the resources have been wasted, and effectively legitimate traffic has been displaced by malicious traffic. And that, that is the, the core of the problem. And that's why uh, denial of service attacks are popular uh, with the people who use them and are quite uh, invasive on the people who, are, uh, who, they're, who the, the attacks are inflicted upon. So if we were looking at the DDoS traffic sources, generally it's infected or compromised machines. Compromised machines is in inadequate passwords uh, on hosted systems or um, basically out of date uh, desktops or even Android phones or Apple phones that actually might be, believe it or not, participating in a botnet. Um, and we're going to talk about the various different things, but the attack could last for about five minutes to up to you know a couple of days. So it's obviously you have to be very careful with that. So um, so DDoS is we use the CPEs or computers. So any device that responds to UDP with a larger message than the requester actually made can actually be used in a denial of service attack. And Microtech CPEs, like any other make a model of CPEs, um, are no exception. So basically. So if you have a DNS responder, if you say give me google.com or give me, there's use, you can use DNS extensions, there's actually a significant, um, you can just send a tiny packet to the router and it will send a very large response, lots of information. So if you spoof someone's request, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, you can actually really hammer them with this. And you, probably a lot of you, because I've certainly seen it on my network where I may have 
may have misconfigured a router or two and was going, where is all this upload traffic coming from? So if you're seeing large upload traffic from your routers in your ISPs, it's quite likely that there's a lot of uh, misconfigured CPEs on your network. Um, and, you know, it is quite common. I've come across at least three different, let's say, customers that we deal with. And in fairness, I have to hold my hand up, I got it wrong myself. So, um, NTP is another one which was quite common. Um, it was flagged years ago for ages, but I think it was when it was used to take out Spam House for a day or something like that, it got notoriety because they managed to, I think it was something like 750 gigabits per second, they managed to uh, amount in the denial of service attack, um, which is a truly frightening number. So, DDoS used to misconfigure servers. Uh, You've got various different ones. You've got DNS, NTP, SNMP. So all those ones obviously are uh, feature sets in Microtech that can actually be misused uh, to attack you or your uh, just other people on the internet. So, so what services are most at list? Well, attackers use love use of DNS, NTP, and SNMP for reflection attacks. And the reason is they use UDP. So UDP is the connection-oriented protocol. You can basically send it, forget it, and you can, like a mortgage application form, you can lie uh, about the source IP address or how much money you make. So it's exactly the same. You can say it was from him. I'm sending you a packet from him. Can you please tell him well, you know, send him loads of data, please. And you could do that multiple times, and you could cause lots of problems. And generally, the amplification factor comes in that the difference between the size of the request going to the misconfigured server and the response from the misconfigured server. Sorry. So, in terms of DNS, the types of stuff that can be used for amplification, if you look at a, a domain with lots of MX records, for example, or DNS extensions, get bulk requests, get net requests, or if you can imagine an SMP query on a, asking for the root table on a full B, a BGP with the full root tables, would be a BGP router with the full root tables. That would be a significant problem. Um, so in NTP, you can also query the clients on some of uh, older NTP servers. This was a, a case. It's not the case with uh, OpenNTPD from the OpenBSD project, but it's, uh, it was, it's, it's obviously the other implementation of NTPD is quite common. So if from this is a, a table of data from the US CERT team. And the key, thing, I suppose I just want to show you what type of figures you're talking about. So if you look at DNS, the amplification factor of an attack is anywhere between 28 and 54. NTP is staggeringly uh, scary at 556. And that's why you got that nice uh, large figure hitting uh, spam house who do an excellent job in controlling spam on the internet today. Um, and then obviously you've got CarGen, which uh, is basically 358. So thankfully CarGen is not, it's kind of more of a legacy thing. It's generally turned off uh, by, uh, on most modern Unix systems or uh, network operating systems. Um, so that's the key thing. So if we look at how the reflected application would work, you can see there that you've got your misconfigured open resolvers. What do I mean by an open resolver? It means that your, potentially your Microtech CPE is listening for DNS requests on the internet interface. Okay? So rather than, obviously you set up DNS uh, the, to forward or on your Microtech CPE to provide local DNS uh, proxy and caching for the user. You don't do it for the rest of the internet. So if you do allow the requests in, what will actually happen is, effectively, you'll become a facilitator, an open uh, resolver. And what you'll also find is, after a while, you'll start to see that that client will have a significant upload problem, as opposed to what he's downloaded. And the reason is, he's getting lots of spoof traffic, and he's participating unwittingly in a denial of service attack on the destination for all those responses. So that's effectively what is happening. So what we see here is obviously on the bottom left hand corner, you've a compromised host and he's generating about 500 megs of spoofed requests, okay? So he's sending it to a load of res resolvers around the internet and effectively he's saying, give it to Arnis over there. So he's using Arnis's IP and he's actually saying, Arnis wants to know this from all of you guys. And then all of the open resolvers basically dutifully respond to what they think is artists' genuine request, and artist gets absolutely clobbered at a, st at a kind of pace of basically at a factor of 54 times whatever was spoofed from the original attacker. And what's really difficult is the attacker 
Arnis, if he runs a scan and he's analyzing the traffic coming to him, he actually doesn't see who his real attacker is. You know, he only sees the people who are just all misconfigured. So that's the kind of the, uh, the aspect of it. So it is pretty nasty. So in that case, Arnis would have been hit with something like around 27 gigabits per second. If he had only a gig interface on his uh, upstream provider, then he would be pretty much taken out. But his carriers and his carrier's carrier, so his upstream ISPs, would have been seeing something of the order of 27 gigabits per second in that case. That's, and that's why you now start to see why the upstream ISPs become such an important player in mitigating a denial of service attack. So what can you do? Well, you can filter, so all you guys, you can filter inbound traffic to your public facing infrastructure, which you should be doing anyway. Um, and generally, it is it's, it's usually, a lot of people are very busy and you can make mistakes, you know, late at night. And, that's, and generally, that's where the misconfigurations come, but just correct them and maybe do an audit from time to time. And we'd be happy to do the audit for you. Okay, that was a shameless plug there, but anyway. Um, so. Basic, can you all hear me okay? Okay, cool, that's just, that's cool. Uh, so basically, what Micrity could possibly do to help, so if there was some, maybe some subtle changes to the R, uh, operation of the device, is possibly implement a CPE mode, so where you have a default route pointing out that effectively the, 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 the DNS server that Microtech CP has would effectively be prevented from listening on that particular interface. So that could be particularly useful. Um, obviously that has limitations that if you're, you, you know, it can only really be done in a CPE context because if you do use Microtech as a DNS server, you know, and it has a default route just onto a LAN, um, obviously then if that, then it, that wouldn't work. So it's only for, let's say, CPEs deployment that might be suggested this. But uh, in fairness, and Ardis was, or Yanis was at pains to mention this to me before, the default configuration out of the box does prevent this from happening. I will accept that. The only thing about it is, uh, probably like most service providers, the first thing you do is you remove the configuration and then you apply your own template. And it's just clear that it's just important for you guys to update your template so that you know you are actually implementing that filter. Okay. Um, so does everyone get that? Is everyone understanding? Is the pace okay? Am I talking too fast? Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. It's a habit. So what can ISPs do? So what, if you're an ISP or a service provider or even a host, a, a, a enterprise a client to a network, you could actually protect other people's networks. This is kind of weird. BCP38 is kind of this whole pay it forward uh, scenario. What I mean by that is if everyone implemented BCP38, it would be a lovely world, okay? The problem is not everyone does because they don't know it or they don't care. So, but the key thing is, if you actually filter any traffic that leaves your network, should only have a source address of a device on your network. It's very simple. So, if you have a public IP address of 1.2.3.4, you should never see, tra your next hop should never see traffic coming from a TED address or from any weird IP address. And this is what actually happens is that you have these botnets on people's PCs and effectively they generate uh, bad uh, spoof traffic. And if ISPs actually all just blocked that traffic out of the outbound, it would actually make a massive difference to the, uh, to the effectiveness of uh, amplified attacks. So just to give you an example of how that those rule sets would look, is effectively you would just simply use a forward rule in your filters and effectively on all your outbound interfaces you would say if it's going out on this interface, so it's going out leaving my network, you would say only allow, allow traffic from my IPs and then you'd have a rule below it saying deny traffic from anywhere else. So any traffic leaving your network should only have your source address. So uh, the slides will be uploaded later, I, I'm conscious of it, but uh, I'm just hoping you got that there. So you can see there, rule number 10, I'm saying, uh, rule number 10 in particular there, drop spoofed IP. So I'm saying if it's not from my prefix lists, please, or list of IP, assigned IP address, 
drop it. And then you can say, I can see, you can see where on, let's say, number 12, I've said, allow our IP addresses explicitly. So that's a very simple rule set. It's not that hard in the router, uh, on your core routers, and it actually makes a big difference to everyone else. Unfortunately for you, it's not that big a deal, but if everyone did it, it'd be a lot better. So what should ISPs do to protect yourselves? Well, there are some things you should do to protect yourself. The first thing is, if you have an IP allocation of, let's say, 1.0.0 slash 8, on any of the traffic coming in, so you have that IP address range, on any of the traffic coming in from the internet, should never have that source address, because they're yours, they're on your network. So you should actually be blocking traffic sourced from, appearing to be sourced from your network coming from the internet, because that's clearly spoofed. And if it is UDP based, it will actually probably attack, it will be most likely destined to attack your, um, your NTP servers, your SNMP uh, listeners, and it will also attack your DNS servers. So this, it's a, 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 pretty much any UDP based service, so it's important to do it. It also prevents misconfiguration where you might actually be transiting local traffic through upstream ISPs, so it prevents this from happening. So it actually is a security feature as well. So ISPs protected themselves, you can see here rule number eight and nine. I'm saying drop traffic inbound to our network from our own IP ranges. So effectively on the in interface, which was our upstream links, basically drop it from a source address, which list, the source address list has a list of all the IPs that I have, okay? So if I was to look at BCP uh, and illustrate it for you, kind of show what I'm talking about. Effectively, you would implement it on your border router predominantly, uh, or the, at the very minimum, that's where you should implement it, okay? And effectively, you could see here that there's root, uh, router one there, border router one, and you can see we obviously have an IP allocation of 185.55.204.0 slash 22. So what I should be doing is saying allow traffic from my network to go out to the internet but drop everything else. And that would actually protect the rest of the internet from any infected hosts on my network. And that's an important point. Um, again, you can see that the amount of protection it offers you is pretty minimal. If everyone did it, as I said, it, the world would be a lot better. So it's a classic pay it forward scheme, and as you know, we're all just selfish feckers, so we, we, don't, you know, we don't have that altruism that we need uh, on the internet. So if we, if we, if a few, and here's the thing, it could be just a handful of large ISPs could actually ruin it for everyone else, because if they have a significant number of clients, um, and they're not implemented BCP. So if, let's say everyone bar 10 ISPs on the internet were, were actually implemented, it it could still be a bit fairly big threat of, a, uh, of a, a reflected amplification attack because those 10 major carriers weren't doing the heavy lifting that they should be. So it's kind of like vaccination. If you want to eradicate it, everyone has to get the jab. So um, what's the benefits? Well, if, as it becomes more widely implemented, it'll actually change botnet behavior because they'll become less reliant on reflected amplification attacks and they'll probably evolve, but the reflected amplifications are very disruptive for uh, amplification attacks, are very disruptive for core networks anyway. So that will be a plus in itself. Um, and it, they, they effectively, because they're less, uh, the reason why botnets wouldn't use it as much is because effectively it's, it's not that effective anymore for them. Malware would, they would react, and the way they probably would react is limit the amount of the way they, in which they spoof. So they likely learn your IP address. So I would see that this would be probably a future trend. Is if you have a zombie uh, device on your network, effectively you would look at its public IP, look up what AS is advertising that IP, and say, well, I probably can get away with spoofing anyone from these few thousand addresses. So they can still mask themselves as a source of an attack. Um, and that's a significant issue. Luckily, there are ways around that of protecting. Um, so if you only implement it at the border, this is a problem. However, what we can do in responding to that malware evolution is we can actually specifically start filtering on client access subnets. And what I mean by that is you can see here, I've added in a configuration just here. Um, uh, access router one, and effectively what I'm saying is it's 
has a slash 24 network allocated to customers. So if we actually filter the traffic coming from them, that's going up, up to our core network, we basically say, we've allocated this slash 24 network, we'll allow that tra traffic from this outbound, but nothing else. So again, it's just like a small, the problem with this, of course, is it's very difficult to maintain. And this is where uh, a brilliant uh, feature in the Linux kernel, um, which is called uh, uh, reverse path verification or reverse path forwarding, uh, was implemented. And Microsoft brought it in, I think, around 2012, late 2012. Um, they basically unlocked the feature for us. And I appreciate uh, the, the work of the guys who do this uh, after their presentation in uh, New Orleans, I think it was what I was suggested. It was a really good feature. And effectively what it does is it uses the configuration you already have on your router. Obviously, if you want all your networks to work together, they have routing configuration. So effectively, what it does is we actually analyze when, it is, when traffic comes in at the interface, we look, do we have a route back to the source of that interface? If it is, then it's valid. If it's not, we, we need to make a decision. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Where uh, We'll actually go in more detail of this. So if you want to turn on Unicast reverse path forwarding, um, and I have to give you a health warning on multipath networks. Um, you have to probably use loose mode more so than uh, strict. But where, where you have a single path, uh, strict is always the preferred option and, and far more effective. Um, but the problem is with strict is that if you had multiple paths, possible paths through your network, um, it will only select the best route. So even if it was legitimate traffic coming in at an interface, it goes, this is the proper way it should be going, I'm dropping it, so it could disrupt your network. So you just have to be careful, but I have turned on loose across most of my core network routers and it has not caused any issue whatsoever. Um, so route traffic based on the traffic arrive, uh, of which interface the traffic came in on. So strict URPF will basically forward packets if the source of the traffic matches the best possible route to that source. The, uh, sorry, uh, let me rephrase that. It'll match it if, if traffic comes in on a given interface, it will forward the traffic if, it, if the best possible route to that source is on that interface. If it's not on that interface, it'll actually drop it. Loose URPF will just say, does the route exist? Okay, let it on. And that's the key thing. And obviously, so that's the key thing. And if the route points to a black hole, and I'll explain that concept in a couple of minutes, then it won't forward the traffic. So, pros. Well, you have full visibility. Uh, no, okay. The other thing is, if you are using URPF, um, and you're using full uh, you're, you're, you're transiting um, on the internet, you're better off using the full route tables because you actually get to do some sort of uh, source validation. So you know the way normally you use the default route, the problem with the default route is that effectively with Unicast reverse path verification, that's kind of saying everything is okay on that interface. While if you had the full route tables, the half a million or so prefixes on the internet, you could actually determine which ones are actually, uh, in, some way, in some way, which ones are spoofed and which ones are not. So the full route tables are, uh, and the area of your network that is, has full route tables should never have a default route configured. So that's called the default free zone and it's good reason for it. And it's to allow mitigation of using uh, URPF and it, that's one of the reasons for doing it. So what are the symptoms of a DDoS? Well, it's basically massive packet loss is usually uh, a good one. The phone hopping is another one. And um, you'll see that links are fully utilized inbound to probably, uh, depending on the type of attack, uh, your uplinks, may, your outbound traffic could be increased. That generally is only for traffic such as uh, TCP SID attacks because obviously you're trying to acknowledge all these SID requests that are spoofed. So in terms of a TCP one, you would actually see a different traffic profile to let's say a standard UDP uh, flood. Um, what you'll also, so 
So how do I protect my network? Well, do your best and hope that it'll prevail over the adversary. And we are actually going to go through some scenarios what you could do, uh, very practical ones. And you can do it even without that much configuration. Uh, the key thing in all this is that you have a provider that has 24-7 cover, and you have a provider who, when you, answer, when you ring and ask to make a change, like a black hole, you, know, you could actually just manually ask for a black hole that they could do it immediately and not have to call an engineer and stuff like that because by the time all that bureaucracy goes, probably the attack could have subsided. So it's important to be able to do that if you're not prepared. So if you get hit in the morning, you, hopefully some of these slides will actually be helpful to you. Um, so how do, I, how do I defend? Well, keep calm, work through it, and you'll be back up soon. So plan your response. The first thing I'd say is you need to talk to your upstream provider about capabilities. A lot of upstream providers, for, and it's out of self-interest, they're not just, it's not just because they love you so much that they want to do this for you, but they actually want to reduce um, malicious traffic across their network. So if you recognize that you're being hit with malicious traffic, they're more than happy to drop it. Because whatever you're, be, whatever you're being hit with, particularly if you have a gigabit interface, that gigabit interface is the limit of what you're going to see. It could be multiple times that what the actual provider is having to deal with. And fortunately, obviously, their hardware, their infrastructure will probably be much, much better able to cope with it. Um, so prepare an incident response plan. What I'm talking about that is kind of who's in control of the situation, change control, what, what are you allowed to do and what not. You have to have procedures in place so that people aren't paralyzed by, oh, I can't get a hold of a manager. Sometimes you just got to get rough with it and deal with it straight. And it's better ask those questions of your managers ahead of time so that you have effectively the nod to respond as appropriate. When the, uh, when, the, uh, the situa uh, when the unfortunate situation of a DDoS occurs. Uh, so identify weak points of your system, mitigate them. Okay, and what I mean by that is like if you have a core router that's literally running at 80% capacity, you really have to look at, well, that means you, all they need to do is just put another 20% on and you're going to start having un unhappy customers. So that's the key thing there, is to have capacity there to deal with some of these issues. Um, and also just plan on how to deal with it. So if I look at the DDoS back, so a couple of days ago, uh, one of our clients was actually hit with a DDoS there. So you can see the background traffic of around 200 megs on this particular transit link. And we see that there's actually about 800 megs on, uh, at a particular time in the middle and you see a follow-on attack uh, at the end which actually approached the maxing out the link. So, um, how do, so in this case those spikes are most absolutely most certainly denial of service attacks um, and if you look at the packets per second, you could get an understanding. So obviously you've got bandwidth, so what size are the packets that are hitting you as well? So you could look at the packets per second, and often a packets per second based denial of service attack mightn't generate that much actual traffic in terms of bulk, but it's actually giving your uh, routers a significantly harder time to forward. So that one there is a key one that I, I would say that is a key indicator of, uh, the, I suppose, the severity of the attack. So the monitoring tools, basically what I'd be saying is have alerts, have thresholds that if you're going at 70, if you're normally pottered along at 30, 40% of a link capacity, which is good practice, and then you see that at, you're at 60, 70%, so you're just, the dial, the dial of service is just ramping up. You really, what you really want to be aware of that so that someone could actually check net flow, check uh, torch, and uh, deal with that and, and actually analyze it. So there are a couple of monitoring tools there from the dude, obviously, which is, uh, Microtix um, uh, monitoring platform, uh, NetXMS, which Thomas Kernak, wherever he is, hi Tom, uh, he suggested to me it's a great product as well, uh, it's free as well, so that one is, uh, uh, there's open NMS, there's a lot of free products out there that allow you to monitor links, uh, then there are ones that will allow you to alert, so you send an email to your doc or an SMS, to your doc just to say you need to get on a router, you need to be checking your net flow analyzers uh, to actually deal with it. So if I was looking at the, just, just an example of a few days ago of a couple of attacks that happened in one day, um, 
So we were just, I suppose, the customer was unlucky uh, that day. But we can see that in terms of the, we had a peak of about 800 megabits per second on the first attack, and about 100,000 packets per second was the hit. Then a few hours later, we had the same number of packets per second hit. You can see that they're roughly the same peaks there on attack two on the top graph. And it's about 100, and, uh, but still, uh, still this one actually managed to max out the, the link. So, and then obviously an attack three was a significantly different attack and what it was was for another client on the network. So what we can safely say is that attack one and two had a very similar signature in terms of packets per second and the potency or the ability of the attacker. However, attack three, believe it or not, was much more, uh, even though they didn't possibly reach the high, uh, high bit rates on their links, they managed to push through around uh, 460,000 packets per second above average, above normal. And so that was actually a more potent one. So there, you can see there were very different styles of attack. You could also see the response, as you can see, the green traffic is actually our upload traffic on those transit links. And you can see that the green, the, the, the traffic there dipped uh, significantly. So I'm going to just discuss that. But well, the reason why we look at those graphs briefly, and don't dwell on it, but it is that if you're finding it very difficult to find a source of attack, like you're just seeing it coming in from everywhere, or you're not sure where it's going, you can start looking at the size of the packets per second and try and understand. So if you take the packets per second that's coming in an interface, and you divide it by the bandwidth of the interface, you can actually measure the size of the packets that are in the attack, roughly speaking. And so there, I'm not going to go into too much detail for the sake of time, but it's in the slides there, but it's fairly simple. So we divided 500 megabits per second by 60,000, and we got uh, roughly, uh, it was a one kilobyte packet that was being used in that attack. However, the attack three was a significantly different one. It was a load of small, tidy 162 byte packets. Uh, again, this is an approximation. And the reason why it's an approximation is that I, I've subtracted what I think is our steady state traffic from it. But you could actually see, if we look at this one, the denial of service attack actually impacts your own normal traffic levels. So and you can see in attack two, that actually our uplink traffic increased significantly, most likely because it was TCP SYN attack against the client. While you see in attack three, it, there's a significant drop off in upload. And that, the reason for that is it's probably just UDP. So they've effectively displaced all of our traffic. You know, so I, the figures that I was quoting you there were probably the most op, uh, pessimistic or optimistic about the attack that it could have been a lot worse. But, that, but it's just to give you an idea of the ballpark you're in and then deal with it. So to remove uncertainty, if you want to actually be absolutely prepared for this eventuality, is using professional or using open source uh, NetFlow products such as EdTop or PeakFlow, which actually do have, uh, obviously, systems that you can use to actually automatically mitigate denial of service attacks as they happen. So Microtik implements NetFlow, which is a full kind of uh, feature uh, based on, this, I believe, a Cisco standard back in the day. Um, it's quite widely used now, but the, the NetFlow can give you your network and an awful lot of information about how, how it works and, uh, and who, who, whose traffic is going where and you know, what's the trend. So you should be able to see who's been attacked in the last five minute window very easily through NetFlow. Um, so SLO is similar to NetFlow, and I think it's a possibility that it's something that maybe Mikrotik could consider, particularly for their higher capacity routers. So that Rotter did actually try to count account for each packet, just do a sample flow, which would obviously be more scalable and less resource intensive on the routers themselves. Um, the real attack obviously can be measured then, before and after. It requires efforts and resources to set up. So if you get attacked in the morning, you do not start going to install NetFlow analyzers and stuff because by the time it's working, uh, your either business would be shut down or the attack would be gone already. So the key thing is, the way to get around that is don't worry, it happens to everyone, including my good self, and that's why Torch exists. So it allows you to shine a light in a very dark place. So an example, so NetFlow is kind of like a, a poor man's 
or sorry, torch is like a poor man's uh, net flow, and net flow is like a rich man's torch. So that's the way I kind of describe it. But as you can see here, you literally just put it on your external, you select the external interface of, the, of your transit provider or one of the transit links, and you just start seeing where's the destination traffic going. And that should outline where the traffic is hitting for your victim, and then just organize it by the bit rate. You can also select protocol and port, and then you'll actually see the nature of the attack because once you know the IP address, you should be able to see the destination. You should see thousands of connections per second just going into them, usually empty, not much traffic on it, but you'll just see just thousands of them there. So implement the plan. So try to identify the target of the attack. That's the first thing you've got to do in a beach, uh, denial of service. Who's been attacked? We need to actually black hole them. So we're going to talk about that concept. Work with the interested provider. So you ring the victim, your, your customer, and you say, you're getting hit with an denial of service. We're going to black hole you, and we're going to have to give you a new IP that's temporarily. And this is kind of a quick and dirty way of getting around it. It is dirty because obviously that requires customer cooperation and reconfiguration of their systems. But it's the only way they're going to get back online. So. Victim profiles, generally, the most common one that I've seen is either gamers or trolls or gamer trolls or gamer trolls or trolls who are gamers or gamers who taunt people, gamers who are... Um, anyway, moving swiftly on, sorry, I didn't want to dwell on that. Gamers, though, seriously, would you stop giving out to you? Sort of, so basically what they do is they buy uh, then the services of some cyber criminals to stress test an IP, which then bumps off the gamer who's been slagging them off and allows the person to proceed to the next level. Um, so that's a common use or misuse of denial of service attacks against uh, some of our clients. Then obviously you have the more, let's say, genuine cases where, uh, and probably more serious, and these are the ones that are more serious, where it's politically motivated um, or uh, commercially motivated with a lot of money involved. So they're the ones that are the most uh, difficult to deal with and I would say probably the most uh, genuine victims I suppose if you could uh, I'm not saying that the gamers are all bad but anyway moving swiftly on it just makes my life more interesting I suppose um, but yeah so work with the victim of the, inform them let them know what the problem is they're under attack, you're trying to work with them to get around us and get them back on the air and make it as easy as possible for them to get on the air so work with them um, so prepare them to migrate to the new one, assist them with DNS moves, that's the key thing there, so short TTLs, that type of stuff, that did, it's all kind of really, but you have to do this like really quick, uh, obviously a quick response, so it's, it is kind of uh, important that, you, that the client is moving quickly with you to deal with it, because effectively you're going to, you should black hole them straight away so that your other clients are not taken off the air as collateral damage. So the real uh, intended victim is that particular person, but anyone who's in their network neighborhood is actually going to be taken out as well. So what are black hole routes? And I've been talking about it there. It's very simple. It's, it's effectively a way of dropping traffic. So your standard firewall filtering that you would be familiar with is you have a three-stage process. So you go through a mangle, Every packet going through a router would go through Mangle, which is pre-routing. It would then go through a routing decision, where is it going, and then through the forward filter, and you would block it at the forward filter. Black holing allows you to do it with the root table. So you actually move the decision forward to the actual routing decision. And that allows you to um, block traffic a lot quicker with less CPU cycles. Uh, that's, when you're actually dealing with large packet per second throughputs, that's a very important uh, aspect to kind of extend your router's capacity when it's under the most stress. So it's important that you do that. And it's efficient, so that's why we do it. So if you want to do a black hole route, so when we actually rig our upstream providers or we advertise a route to them, they effectively create a black hole route. A microtick uh, also allows you to create those. So if you're a service provider for a, an enterprise, you could use this technique to black hole traffic. And it's simply what you do is you generally enter in a route like you normally would, like a static route. And instead of using the type unicast, you select black hole. Very straightforward. And that will actually start discarding traffic for them. Once that step is completed, the level of traffic will decrease and you, uh, your network will return to normal. Um, and you'll have to start then migrating your client back on you know, to a new IP. 
and you may have to repeat that depending on how much they have annoyed the other adversary. So it's just an important thing. So faster response to DDoS issues, obviously that's very manual and very labor intensive, and is there a way of, of actually automating it? Yes, there is. And the way we do it is with remote trigger back holes. And what we do is we actually use BGP and extended communities feature of BGP to actually communicate with our, our transit providers or our peers, uh, IPs we wish to black hole on their networks. And they will do that because it's out of their own self-interest. Simple as that. So if I was just to give you an example of what I mean, the intercept simplified, you've got your various different carriers there with different size links. So what you can see is my AS, now I remember uh, I had a spell check misfortune in the US and instead of AS it kind of said, did you mean ass instead of AS? So it was definitely AS. So if you see ass anywhere, it is, we are talking about autonomous systems. But uh, as you can see here, we're, we have two one gig links up, link, uh, upstream and then obviously all these up Street providers then have 10 gig links or 40 gig or 100 gig links between them. And so they can actually be better able to deal with the attack. So you enter the zombie armies and the botnets, so they're all there lurking away. So then someone hands over a few quid to, uh, I suppose, what they call a cyber criminal or something like that. And so they start generating traffic, which they want to hit your network with, okay? So what? So the flood will converge to your network. You'll only see, in this case, probably two gigs of traffic, while everyone else has to, all the other transit providers are probably dealing with significant multiples of that. So what do you do? Well, if we advertise upstream with BGP, and it's the same way you would advertise your own IPs, but instead of advertising your own, allocations, you just actually advertise to a special root server called a black hole root server, uh, the actual IP of the victim, it'll automatically be propagated on your service provider's network to actually drop the traffic. And that is the piece of the resistance, that's the, that's the one that actually will allow you to quickly do it without ever actually contacting your provider. So you, so it's a, as a good call, a friend of mine, uh, Colour Flea would say, uh, an ounce of preparation is better than a ton of cure. So, and uh, um, for you, I suppose you're all European. That would be like a kilogram of preparation is better than a ton, a metric ton of cure. So that's basically the story there. So by actually reducing, by actually signaling that with your upstream through BGP and extended communities, and each one of your providers, when they give you a handover pack, you'll often find that there's an extended community on your existing peering sessions with them, or in the case of Cogent, which is my preferred option, uh, Cogent will actually say, here's our black hole root server, you can peer with it if you want. So it's a completely separate system to your actual core routing infrastructure. What's really neat about it is, that router that advertises those IPs can be as small as a 750. So your smallest cheap, uh, sorry, your smallest good value router could, sorry, your small, could actually do it. So if you were stuck and said, I don't have a router, just go down to the stores and pick even a client unit and configure it as a, a peer to that black hole root server. And all it's doing is send it a signal of, you know, 32, uh, 32 byte IP address and it just send it to them. And that's, that's what's really neat about that, you know? And you're effectively, you're just doing a signal, it's like a hydraulic, you know, servo. You're just putting that little signal out there and then you're allowing a massive machine clobber the data that's hitting your network. So it's a key thing there. So, uh, how am I doing on time? I'm going well over, am I? I'm on time, okay, cool. So, I'm not finished yet. So, okay, reduce the income attack. So we were talking about that. So let's say you've really annoyed someone and they're actually hitting your entire prefix range. It's rare, thankfully, uh, and it's very difficult to deal with. So if you have a typical ISP, you have your internet, you have your peer networks, which you can see. You have your core infrastructure, you've got your backhaul subnets, and you have customer access networks. So what we're actually saying is that our entire IP range is being hit by this phantom menace, and we're trying to actually deal with it. So if you started to look at what IPs can I, what do I need to keep on, and what IPs do I not need to have internet access, 
you can start to rationalize that and start reducing the traffic by actually black holing significant portions of your network. And it's, believe it or not, it's actually possible to black hole significant portions of your network without affecting user uh, experience. That's a really key point. So for instance here, what we obviously say is customers' IPs are ones that you can't really black hole, you try to avoid do them. Some core infrastructure IPs, obviously websites, uh, ticketing systems, DNS, and all this type of stuff. But not much else actually needs to be routable on your infrastructure. So what IPs don't have to be? Well, if you look at our lovely diagram there, um, we could back all subnets can be pretty much removed. So like a subnets between routers, management IPs if your user public are uh, unique. Uh, I, uh, global IPs but are not publicly rootable, unallocated for IPs. So if, you've, uh, if you have, a, let's say, an allocation of 8,000 uh, IPs and you only have 4,000 customers, you can probably drop off the last, latter 4,000 addresses without causing an impact. Um, so that's the other one. So our unused IPs, and I'll discuss that, and that's where someone says, I need a slash 25 because I'm so important in a big organization. But if you ever did a scan of their network, you always see that there's about two devices connected. So they have 120 odd addresses, but they actually only have two connected. So that's a key one there. Um, so if an IP address doesn't need to be internet accessible, then can we simply black hole it? And the answer is yes, we can. So let's just, for an analysis, and this is taken from uh, a presentation I did in the US, but basically you'll see some analysis of a slash 30. Now if you look at this slash 30, um, you've got f obviously four IPs that are there. You've got your network address and your broadcast address, the default gateway, which is your next hop, and the client's router as well. Okay? So what IPs need to be accessed from the internet? Well, I can safely say the client IP address. And we can safely block the broadcast address at the network address because we never use them anyway, uh, as in for connectivity. So we can actually black hole them. And so we black hole zero and three on that example. So now we've actually reduced that network attack surface by 50%. Can we lock it down further? I think so. And what we can actually do is we can also black hole our own next half I say that the, our, the router interface that's face, on our router that's facing the client, that doesn't need to be internet accessible. The, all the customer needs to be able to access it and route packets to it, but no one on the internet needs to talk to it. So you can black hole that. So by that, you've actually reduced your, your attack surface on that particular summit by 75%. The customer IP is unaffected by that change. That's really, that's pretty slick in my humble opinion. So downside, trace routes from your network to clients and from external people on the internet won't work. Boo hoo hoo, okay, who cares, it's actually worth it. So you'll have gaps in your trace routes. It's a small price to play, particularly if you're uh, being attacked. So it'll increase the sizes of your routers, routing tables. So this was a controversial comment from the US, but I basically say if you're worried about that, just buy bigger routers. Um, and uh, biatches, so you could do that. Uh, and obviously, Microtik are going to bring out 64-bit router OS x86 edition. Didn't see the announcement this morning, but I know what's happening. That right, Aaron, uh, is, well, hopefully, anyway. He's nodding. I think it's coming. So, um, so what about slash 29? So we can apply the same logic again. I'm glad you asked. Um, we can apply the same logic. So we've gotten rid of three IPs out of the eight possible ones there. So three of the eight IPs have gone, so we've, got, we've reduced our tax service by about 37.5%. Any more improvements? Well, yeah. We can. How many IPs are active on the client side? If it's just the one IP, uh, you could just black hole the rest of them. Or perhaps they're using VRRP or HSRP, so they have actually, uh, they're using three IPs. So you can see here we've got four, five, and six are the real IP, uh, four or five are real IPs, and six is the HSRP or the VRRP IP, or the virtual IP on the low balancer or router that's uh, connected. So in this case, we've actually achieved a 62.5% reduction in attack surface. If there's only two used IP addresses, well then you can do six of eight, so you're back to a 75% reduction. 
And if the customer just used one because they just asked for a slash 29 just in case, you could actually black hole seven of the eight IPs in that submit, and you would actually effectively reduce it by 87.5%. So if my entire network was under attack, the, the effect of doing this technique is that you could actually reduce the traffic hitting your network by the order of the number of black hole IPs divided by the number of IPs in your entire allocation, that, or the number of IPs that are actually being attacked in your allocation. So start planning your defense is my advice and use network plan. Um, you know, and when you're getting really desperate and you're trying to find those ARP scanning, that's what you get your help desk guys to do to try and reduce your attack surface further. So if you're not sure how many customers are actually deploying more devices than just the one IP in a slash 29, um, get your help desk guys monitoring that um, and, you know, uh, compile effectively like an Excel spreadsheet and dump it in then to your black hole router configuration. So it's a really important thing. And if things get really scary, as I was just saying there, ARP scattered, just, if there's no ARP entry on the slash 29 subnet, then the IP address doesn't exist. So whatever you do, don't just do ping to see if they're alive, do ARP scanning locally, because if there's a device as a firewall, it could well be blocking ICMP ping, but no matter what way the device is configured, except for static ARP, of course, but uh, in, for dynamic ARP, there will always be an ARP entry in your table if they're actually using it. So do a scan and you should be able to see it. And by doing that, if you had a slash 24 of, like, so you have a slash 24 allocation and you had a load of slash 30s there, you could actually, uh, or you could actually reduce your uh, attack surface by about 90%, which is pretty, pretty impressive. So filter based on source, so uh, the only thing I'll say, uh, so. Obviously, you could do filter based on source. You could only do that within your own network because a lot of the source traffic will be spoofed. But if you feel that this particular traffic is blocking, uh, causing you hassle, you could do it. There are issues though. If it's 8.8.8 .8 .8 is the apparent IP that's hammering your network, you're going to ruin everyone's DNS service, so you'll have to work around that. Um, thankfully, Microtech has lots of features to do that, so you could do destination that's so divert the 8.8 .8 request to a local DNS server and black hole the 8.8.8 .8 service. If so would spoof of that and try to screw your network. So automatic route tri uh, remote triggered black holes uh, between ISPs are a very useful feature. Um, and <coughs> just remember to only, oh, five minutes, thank you. Cheers, sorry about that. Um, so, so basically the main thing is to only ever advertise IPs, like you only allow black holing of IPs that were within your own network to your upstream providers. They should only allow you to black hole IPs in your own network. They, you, you should be able to, like if Arnis and me were connected to the same ISP, I should be able to say, actually, can you blacklist microtech.com because it's been hit. So it, they should be filtering that I can't do that even if we're connected to the same uh, upstream provider. It's a key important thing. So I'm going to, yeah. I think it's probably better I answer a few questions, but you can catch me anywhere. I'm reasonably approachable. I don't bite, uh, un unless you're a lady, and I'm joking. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> moving swiftly on. But uh, thanks for your attention. And